All right. Hi, I'm Hugh Schoff from the Department of Emergency Medicine, Um, also uh, Quality and Safety Officer for Graduate Medical Education and uh, Quality and Safety kind of liaison for the hospital. I'm involved in hospital quality and safety as well as university quality and safety, so both sides. Um, I'm actually from Alabama, went to UAB for undergrad, or for, excuse me, med school, Uh, came back here for residency, back there for fellowship in quality and safety, and then came back up here uh, for a job. So thanks for having me. Um, I know uh, I appreciate everybody being kind of interested in this topic. Before you glaze over, hopefully you'll get the first five or six slides in. Um, And also I wanted to say kind of personally, thanks for everything you guys do in the emergency department. I know consultants aren't always great. You guys, I'm sure some of them you don't want at all. But uh, thanks very much for coming down. I know it's a busy place, and you guys work pretty hard, so thank you. All right, so disclosures, I have to do this. I'm not an expert. I just know a little bit about this. Uh, Any jokes are meant to be lighthearted, so if you make fun of another service, it's not meant to be personal, and nothing nothing financial to disclose. And just an outline of kind of where we're going to go. History, why is this important to everybody? Um, Who do we strive to be? How do we get there? Uh, how do we improve, and then a case at the end to kind of run through. And I'll work to try and get you guys finished by two. All right, so history. Everybody likes a little bit of history. This is quality improvement really started as a industrial engineering field. This guy here, his name's Walter Schuert, Western Electric Company. He was hired by Bell Telephone, and it's why Bell Telephone really made a lot of money. Back when they were first starting telephones, they found that they were having a lot of problems with their uh, and errors in their manufacturing process. So he came up with the PDSA cycle, and we'll talk about that later. After Schuert, there was Edwards Deming. This gentleman um, was during World War II, and so does show of hands, anybody in here drive a Toyota? A couple of people do. So. Why do to- the reason that Toyotas can go 200,000 miles, 300,000 miles is because of this guy. So after World War II, he was hired by the Japanese to go over and revamp their industrial sector. Of course, it had been decimated during the war. And so he went over and was really kind of the founder of a lot of the quality improvement initiatives and ways that we do things in the industrial section or sector. And, uh, and this is being applied to healthcare today. And the same thing with this gentleman, Joseph Duran, Dr. Joseph Duran. He lived to uh, 103 years old, not too bad. Uh, but he was an electrical engineer that did kind of the same things. So as we go on, we want to know why is this important to us and why do we need to care? Um, so in 1999, this was kind of the landmark report that came out. The Institute of Medicine released this report to Air as Human. This was an assessment of our healthcare system um, and medical errors. In this report, they attributed approximately between 44,000 and 98,000 deaths can be attributed to some medical error that was done, happened to the patient while in the hospital. And at that time, that was the eighth leading cause of death in the country. The next, rep- this is a more recent, this came out in 2013. Now, this is a very controversial study. Um, they look, it was difficult, it's really kind of difficult if you think about it, how to attribute a death to a medical error because we're not putting that on death certificates or anything like that. But this report went back and looked and found that between 210 and 440,000 deaths, which made it the third leading cause of death in the country. So everybody became really kind of hyper-acute to this, really interested in it. Um, this number is probably a little bit inflated. The number is probably more around 100,000 deaths but it still raised the issue of the problem. And what this report really did find, too, is that this is not on the individual. The individuals aren't making errors. It's the systems around you. It's the processes that we put in place, the EMRs, the lab, et cetera, that are allowing these errors to happen and that we can prevent them. So they came out, the next report Institute of Medicine came out with was called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And in this report, they came out with six aims. This is the areas in which we want to improve or focus our improvement. Um, The six aims were safe care, effective care, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable care. Um, I don't know, you know, some of the studies you read, patient-centered care, you spend an extra five minutes with a patient in a clinic. They show better adherence to medications, decreased visits, follow-ups, et cetera. 
the idea that you sit down in a room with a patient and they think you're there 10 minutes longer than you really are, uh, safe care, timely, all these things are important. And here's a real-life example of why quality improvement is important. This happened 2010. <coughs> this lady was 35 weeks present, pregnant. She's 24 years, 24 years old. Uh, she was losing weight, you know, intractable nausea, vomiting. They had a tube in and tube feeds. Well, the tubing matched between the IV tubing and the tube feed tubing. So the nurse hooked up the tube feed tubing to the IV, and she, you know, of course, rapidly deteriorated and died. The interesting thing here is in 2008, this was a co topic that came up, and they tried to advocate to get the tubes to change so they weren't, weren't compatible. They successfully lobbied and didn't get it changed and kept it the same, and then the next year she dies. They are changed now. If you go up and look, they, won't, they don't work, but it took a while. So this is why quality improvement can hit home sometimes. We have instances like this. And, of course, it's in the literature. Um, this is uh, Reporting Medical Errors to Improve Patient Safety, uh, Journal of Graduate Medical Education. Uh, cardiology, of course, is interested in quality improvement and endoscopy as well. So you're going to see this more and more in the literature. And then the other thing, I don't put slides in here about uh, reimbursements, Medicaid and Medicare, because people really glaze over when they hear about that. But when it comes to reimbursements and payment and, and uh, value-based purchasing, all of this is going to come down to metrics that they measure. Whether that's good or bad, we, that argument can happen all day long. But when you leave and go out to find a job, if you're working as a group, or for me, like if I go out and work for a private ER group, I'm going to be measured on my metrics. And reimbursement to the group is based on how well we're doing, based on Medicaid reimbursement. And so being smart about this topic and having an understanding of it will allow you to be at the table to decide what you want to be measured on. You don't want you want to be there to talk about it. And physicians are important to be there because if you you know sometimes you get other people that aren't as well versed in what you do deciding what you're going to be measured on. And so having an understanding is important. So why do we who do we want to be like as an industry? Um, and these are the ones that are used all the time as being safe industries. These are called high reliable organizations. And the three of them is the Navy, air, the um, airline industry, and nuclear power. So think about these industries. They're very highly complex um, with remarkable safety records. If you think about planes, I mean, what goes into flying a bunch of people in a metal sausage tube? It takes a lot of stuff, and we don't have a lot of incidents, right, compared to automobiles. Or the Navy. You have a bunch of 20-year-old kids on a highly volatile concrete surface with planes and bombs and everything like that, and they do it remarkably well. So we want to be like these, and they, they kind of rule, they, they work on five principles, and you'll hear these. These preoccupation with failure, the idea that no matter what, your process can always fail. Healthcare, same way. We're, all, we're never going to be infallible, never going to be perfect. A reluctance to simplify. Never think that our processes are simple. They're always complicated. Sensitivity to operations is an understanding of what we do in the hospital and medical care, all the way from environmental all the way up to administration. Uh, resilience is the idea that if something happens, how quickly can we rebound? How quickly can we get back to doing what we were supposed to be doing? And a deference is expertise is the idea that you look to the person who has the most knowledge about a topic um, to, to get your answer. So, for instance, when I was... An intern uh, at the VA, I like to make an association with Dr. Gariola. We all know what that's kind of like. Um, and you didn't know how to do the vent, who was the best person to look to for the vent? It was not me. It was the restorative <coughs> therapist or somebody who had an idea of what they were doing. So always looking to the person who knows, and that's never, almost never, the person at the very top. So let's talk about patient safety. Uh, who here has heard of the Swiss cheese model? I hope most everybody. Good. So the idea of the Swiss cheese model is that we have multiple layers um, in which processes or decision-making goes through. And at each level, you have the opportunity to catch an error. But every once in a while, all those holes line up, and it gets through. So all of these areas are called latent conditions. These are things that are just hanging around, um, and they catch things here and there. But once it passes all the way through, it becomes an active error, and that's the patient safety event. 
So here at the hospital, I know you guys had to talk about this by the psychiatry group, I believe, but yeah, we talked about it this morning. It's patient safety, the PSNs, I'm going to reiterate it because sometimes you're hearing it twice as important. Um, we also, I think you guys got badges. Are you all wearing the badges? We don't need the stinking badges. Remember that movie? All right. There's badges. Good. Some of you have badges. Juliana has her badge. I don't know what the badge is. I didn't see the badge. <laughs> it tells you how to do a patient safety report. It's not. It's it's nice, It's but it's not too difficult. You don't have to wear the badge. Uh, honestly, in every computer in the hospital, and we're going to get this linked into Cerner, is this symbol here. And we're actually probably going to, we might be going to a new system, but in the meantime, PSN. A PSN, Patient Safety Network, it's a one, it's a form that you fill out online, and you just put in basic information, and you submit it, okay? Um, and you can submit it for lots of things. We try and avoid the, the nurse yelled at me today, and I'm upset with her, so I'm going to put in a report, and vice versa. The nurse puts in reports about the doctor, oh, doctor didn't call back, and I'm going to put in a report. We try to avoid a little bit of that unless it actually causes a delay or something in patient care. But really, this is your area for medication errors, uh, issues with the uh, EMR, et cetera. <clears throat> and so what happens if we don't report these things, right? It reduces the organization's ability to quantify the risk. If you don't report it, we don't know it's there. Uh, and the second thing is, is if the hospital doesn't know it's there, we don't know what to put resources towards to fix. And so we're going to put resources towards what we know, and if we don't know it, it's just going to keep going on. So it's important to do reports. This is called, uh, this is actually a uh, fishbone diagram. Yeah. So what happens when we actually write the PSN? Like, how does that person get feedback on the data measure? So that's a good question. We're going to talk about feedback in a minute because that's a big issue. But what happens here in the hospital with PSNs is you put a PSN in and it goes to the quality department, okay, quality and safety department. They review it and they uh, determine, is this a sentinel event? Is this something that's going to affect uh, accreditation, et cetera? That stays at a high level. Or is this a bad patient outcome? Um, if not, if it's just something that needs like a process improvement or something like that, it will go to that department. So, for instance, it will come down to the ED for me if it's on the physicians or if it will come down to the nurse manager for a nursing issue or a process issue. Yep. So uh, fishbone diagram, this is a nice way to look at um, if you're looking and trying to figure out where medical errors happen and break it down. This is also called an Ishikawa diagram. But basically what it does is you find out what's your problem. So this is pretty much kind of dictates what's hap what I've gotten feedback in our hospital, why we don't report. You have your problem here and you have all your um, things that contribute to it. So there's fear of legal repercussions. And that's always a big one, right? I don't want to report it. I don't want to bring it up because it might come back on me. Luckily, uh, and to address that, two things. One, there is legislation in the House currently, although they're, they're out of session now, but it's going to provide protections for peer review process. So if you have a peer review committee or you have a committee that discusses this, it's protected from um, being brought up in court or being discoverable. The next thing, though, is, is that multiple places have shown, for instance, Brigham, uh, Women's and Children's, and Harvard have shown that the more transparent you are, the actual less legal risk you have, the less money, the less litigation. So we are going to try and strive here to be a lot more transparent, back to your feedback question, uh, about patient safety and getting involved. Um, all the way, then people don't know how to report, who fills it out. Some people think that a verbal report is enough uh, or just telling somebody, telling the nurse, they'll put it in. Um, and then the big one, lack of feedback. How do I know something's being done and how do I get that feedback? Um, so we talked about kind of the main barriers and here the big three are knowledge. How do I report? I'm afraid to be blamed by somebody and I'm not getting any feedback. Um, so we're looking at a new system that we might go to in which feedback will be automatic and much more robust. You'll be able to see what happens, seeing what decisions. And it really is true that if you don't see an improvement for what you're doing, then why are you going to do it in the first place? So we are going to work on that. So here's an issue. Here's an example of the blame game I use. So anybody from Atlanta or no Atlanta? Hey, there you go. You know, Northside Drive and I-71? 
Yes, that was that fire. This was a bus, but that was a yeah. So, <laughs> so in Northside Drive and I seventy one, there was this interchange here, and um, and there was about between ninety eight and two thousand seven. There's eighty accidents at this interchange. Okay, so what ended up happening is this bus driver, and it actually had a, had a I believe it was a minor league team, baseball team, or somebody from Ohio was on this bus. 29 people were injured, seven were killed. When this bus driver was new to this route, came down this road, went up the ramp, didn't slow down, went right through the other side and off the ramp. Okay? Bus driver died. A bunch of other, seven, six other people were killed, 29 injured. Um, immediately, the press blamed the bus driver. They said it was the bus driver. He was, must have been drunk, must have been high, must have been something. Uh, should have been an EXI, an ED, something like that. Right, so he went off. So they went back, and it took a long time. But what they found is, anybody notice what's on this ramp sign that would make you think why he might have done that? Yeah. Right. So what's the triangle mean? HOV lane. So buses are allowed to drive in HOV lanes, and he's driving down here. There's a triangle painted on the road here, the triangle here. Didn't know the route, and went right off that. And when they went back and looked, they found that most of those accidents were due to that as well. So it was a process issue. It's not the driver. Driver ended up still being kind of blamed in a way, but ultimately they found that they redid this whole interchange and fixed that. But when you think about blaming the hospital, it's don't, don't be quick to blame somebody. It's not quick. It's not this one person or that. Think about what process enabled that error to happen and can we fix that. And then once you do find errors in something significant, there's root cause analysis, and these are kind of deep dives. So has everybody, has anybody in here participated in an official RCA? One? Okay. So if you do get an RCA, don't worry if you are involved in that. But what that usually is is a deep dive and to figure out what happened. And a good way to do that is to do what's called the five whys. So basically ask why five times. And you dig deeper and deeper and deeper until you figure out what could happen. And it's a nice method. Uh, so here's another example. Um, Randy Quaid. Everybody knows Randy Quaid? You know his twins? What happened with his twins? It says twins were in the ICU when they were born. They were very young. And what ended up happening, they both had IVs. They're both in the same room. Dennis Quaid comes in one day, and the... Uh, lead physician for the hospital, CMO, and risk were standing at the door. And behind the door, the baby, one baby was bleeding out the mouth and the eyes. The other baby had blood coming out of the umbilical cord that was hitting the floor. Um, and he freaks out, of course. And he's become a huge advocate for patient safety because what ended up happening is they went to flush their IVs. And the heparin bottles were labeled like this. They didn't have a Pixis. They didn't do armband scanning. And they looked a lot alike, Right. This is 10,000 units, this is 1,000 units. So the nurse reached in, grabbed the blue bottle, filled it up, gave each kid a treatment loading adult dose of heparin. Yeah. So, of course, like the previous case, it took multiple times before something changed. 2006, six babies were given uh, heparin overdose. 2007 was the Quaid 10s. 2010, Nebraska toddler dies of the same thing. So we finally... After a long period of time, it just took a little bit, but finally relabeled it. So this is what it used to be. This is now the current heparin in the small bottles. So let's talk about when you find an error, how do we improve it? So quality improvement is really a data-driven, which is key. We have to have data to be able to do this, uh, to the analysis of performance um, and efforts to improve it. Um, so you end up getting better patient outcomes, better system performance, and be better professional development. And really, quality improvement is this gap here. So as we progress over time, patient care pretty much stays on a nice, even keel. But our scientific understanding usually outruns it, right? So we're usually behind, and this gap is where we can improve. So we need to look at some models. How do we do this? It's not as easy as just coming sitting down on a paper. Let's use some tools to figure this out. And really, all models are wrong in the sense, but if you combine some things, it helps you get your ideas. Um, they provide rules, kind of uh, some sort of uh, structure to it, uh, and you can operationalize it. So the different models that you'll hear, uh, PDSA cycle, model for improvement, Six Sigma, Lean, and Lean Six Sigma. All right. So the PDSA cycle was what Schuert came up with, and then the IHI 
which you might have heard of that. That's where some of the modules have come from. Uh, but this, they came up with this kind of adapted uh, way to do it. And the key thing here is, is before you ever do a project, you really want to ask these three questions. Why are we doing it? Uh, how will we know that a change is, uh, is an improvement? And this is a real key question. So I get a lot of people that come up and say, I want to improve this. But if there's no way that I can measure if there's an improvement, there's no need in doing the project in the first place because we can't prove that we've actually changed something. And will it actually result in an improvement or not? If you can answer yes to all those or have an answer to those, then you go into this cycle where you come up with a plan, you enact it, study the results, and you either keep it there or go back through the cycle. Lean is um, really kind of came out of Toyota. And this is what uh, Toyota did with their car. Excuse me. There it is. Um, and it's an idea of reducing waste. So in the ED, we just did a project with the lab where we did a lean project where we reduced as much waste as we could with lab turnaround times. So what we found out was in the lab, in the ED, we were ordering a rainbow of tubes on every, every single patient that came in. Because what if we needed this? What if we needed that? Uh, what that ended up doing is that ended up putting at least three, probably three tubes per patient in the lab to sit on the machine and take up space. And then the lab keeps all tubes for five days. So then they were storing them in a huge storage container for five days. So what we did was we revamped all of our triage order plans to where they were much more chief complaint driven, only what we needed. We sacrificed some re-sticks sometimes. Some patients are just are going to get re-sticked, or re-stuck, excuse me. And uh, ended up reducing time. So for a CBC now, it went from 59 minutes to 42. Uh, for CMPs, we went from 63 down to like, I think it's now 41. And um, overall process time we reduced is about 10 minutes per patient for the phlebotomist. So if you think about per patient, and the phlebot the phleb we found out we basically saved eight hours a day for on the phlebotomist side and saved at least 30 minutes on turnaround time for labs just by reducing waste. Um, we didn't change anything else. It didn't change how we did it. We just streamlined the process. Um, and so that's something that I really, I, I really believe in is that quality improvement and patient safety, we're not trying to change, or I'm not trying to change medical care. I know that we all look at patients, we treat patients based on their presentations. We need to change the processes around it to make it easier for us to do that job and quicker to do that job. And that's what this is based on. The next thing is Six Sigma. This came out of Motorola uh, and their telephones. Six Sigma is basically standard deviations. It's six standard deviations. One Sigma, 69, about 69, 691,000 defects per million, all the way up to six, which is three defects. Some companies reach Six Sigma but successfully. They only have three defects per million produced. Can anybody think of anywhere in the medical field that we get above two Sigma? There is one area in the hospital which gets about four sigma, pretty close. Not our hospital. I don't, I'm not saying our hospital, in healthcare. Like production? In errors. So if you think about errors per million tries. So you could think of per million appendicitis. Is there any errors? Per million uh, casts, per million echoes, EKG reads, stuff like that. All right, anybody? I guess. Blood. Blood? Nope. I have a lot more defects. I have a lot of defects. All right. Anesthesia. In ASA, class one, healthy individuals intubating them for surgery. We'll get around between three and four sigma. So that's not bad. But overall medical care, where do we think we are? Probably about 1.2. We have a lot of defects in medical care. All right. So lean six sigma is they combine it. They combine the ideas of reducing waste and eliminating defects. Um, so when you look at what our problem is and when you look at what you want to use to do this, do we want to do a lean process? Do we want to do waste or the flow? Do we want to do a Six Sigma process where we reduce variation? Um, or do we want to just do a quality improvement project? Most of the time, if you guys are going to do it, it would be a model for improvement, I think, is the best way to go. I think it's a nice way to just organize your thoughts and come up with, and I know Dr. Kubiak does this in her clinic, so teaches this too. Um, she's really big on this. 
And so she's a great resource if you guys need, or you can always come to me. But I think model for improvement is really important. So people will always say this is just the manufacturing. This doesn't apply to healthcare. But I, we disagree, or I disagree. Healthcare is ideal world. We don't want to make errors. We want it on time. We want it efficiently and safely. So let's move on. We'll do a quick case, um, kind of, and get you guys. Should be done pretty soon. All right, so a medicine resident, and I made this up. I have never been in a medicine clinic. So a medicine resident seeing a 59-year-old female. She has a UTI, um, and he or she requests the nurse give a patient a bacteria. The nurse notes that the patient is allergic to sulfur, and the resident changes the order of nitrofurantoin. He tells her to give her a dose of that. The nurse goes to the cabinet, chooses the bottle, gives the patient the medication. The patient is walking out of the waiting room. She begins to have shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. This is a real case. The resident recognizes the patient is having an allergic reaction and sends them to the emergency department. All right. So what happened? Is the nurse to blame? Who's to blame? And what do we do about this? So what do you guys think is the first thing you would do in our clinics? Or in the, say you, something like this happened in the hospital. What would you do first? Anybody? You had two lectures on it. You have a, some people have a card on their... Put in a PSN, right? All right. Do that first. All right, please try and do that as much as possible. We really want you guys to be involved as much as you can to help fix these things. All right, so who's to blame? So a good way to do this, let's do the five whys, right? So why did she develop anaphylaxis? Well, she ended up giving, being given a sulfa drug. So why was she given the sulfa drug? <clears throat> well, the nurse looked in the EMR, was confused because the order for mitrofuratone was verbally ordered, but Bactrim was still ordered in the EMR, then when she reached in the cabinet, she was getting the uh, nitrofurotoin. She actually grabbed the other bottle. So you wonder, okay, well, why'd she grab the other bottle? Well, they were placed next to each other in the cabinet. Uh, they had pretty much the same kind of labeling because it was really easy to go in and grab it. Um, and so the uh, hospital itself had bought the medications from the same company. So they were labeled the same. They had the same shape, color, size. Uh, all that was different was one word at the very bottom of the bottle, which was the name of the drug. Everything else was the same. Um, so when they stock that cabinet, too, they bring it up and they put everything just wherever there's space in the cabinet. So there was no organization system, nothing like that. They, the stalker would just grab a bunch of bottles and put them in the cabinet where they could. So they ended up being next to each other. So if you look at why this happened in our Swiss cheese, um, the latent errors, order placement communication, the formulation in the bottle, and the organization all led to this issue, right? So if anybody asks, say you come in for the clear visit or something like that, you guys have done now a root cause analysis. All right, you've done five whys on a case. All right, so what model? This, we can look at the model for improvement. So what, do you guys, what would you guys want to do or enact to try and improve this to prevent it from happening again? Not all at once. You guys, what would you guys want to do? Reorganize the method. Okay, we could do that. We could reorganize that. Some more stop in the system to be, even keep from ordering that drug anyways. Sure, that's good. Mm -hmm. So he had ordered the medication that she was allergic to, right? And so you're right. It didn't give a stop. And there wasn't in there. Had the nurse uh, talk to the doctor you know, for the confirming. Okay. Another check. Good. This may be a little bit far fetched, but like patients who, at least your patients who know they have a certain kind of allergy, educating them that these are the kinds of drugs you shouldn't take. So, you know, she wouldn't have taken back to her she had with the cell phone. Mm hmm. And that's good. Um, so, communication to the patient of what you're actually giving, right? It's good. Yep. I've never had anybody edu want to educate the patients yet, so that's good. Not bad. All right. Good. What about what else? What do we do here in the hospital before the nurses give a medication? Okay, one at a time. What? So we sometimes we'll just say we're about to order the, this or whatever and we'll order it. Okay. Or maybe if they say, okay, well, let's see if she can't before I can administer it, then it would have been okay. Good, right, because it was verbally ordered. So you could, yeah, we require, um, we try to require all medications in the system beforehand. What else do nurses do with the patients? They scan their bracelets. Good. Ar armband scanning. 
So armband scanning is something we're looking at now because we some units are really great at it and some units are really bad at it. So one floor has a armband scanning rate in the 60% and another one has 90%. It's something really easy to do that we can help. So good. All right, so we could do a cycle, right? You could say, okay, we can actually measure this. We could measure medication errors in my clinic um, over the course of a certain period of time after I implement one of these. So what they did at this clinic, um, all orders had to be placed in the EMR. The pharmacy relabeled the medications. Uh, they couldn't buy PIXIS. They didn't have the funding for that or something. So you, you couldn't do the uh, put in the patient name and pull it out. But they relabeled it and separated them. Um, and then armbands were implemented in the clinic. So they, did it, they were able to scan into the EMR. So that's how they did their process improvement. All right. So this is an intro. We, you know, it goes a lot deeper, but really the goal of this is for you guys to understand some of the key terms uh, and some of the ways that you can help assist and improve things around you. Um, I want everybody to not be afraid of er errors as much anymore. We'd like to, the culture kind of to shift a little bit to where we can speak more openly about them um, and bring them up because we really want the best for our patients. And I think the more we talk about it and the more we can improve what we do around them, um, the better we can be as a hospital. And we'll have a lot of opportunity as it comes up as we uh, move forward to do that. And I think that's a good place to start. Um, quality improvement is easily publishable. Okay, There's lots of great journals. The IHI has a conference every year in which they have really well-attended poster presentations that are easy to get, not easy, I mean, you can't just put anything in there, but you can get posters put up, that sort of thing. There's lots of quality journals now, um, so it's nice, It's they're good, because everybody wants to know what everybody else is doing and how they changed it. So quality improvement's really a good field to do that in. Um, if you do want to do quality improvement, I, and you're going to publish it, IRB is required, but we just talked to the IRB recently, and it's not a hard process. You don't have to do the full thing, okay? So it's really easy. Come talk to me or uh, Dr. Kubiak or somebody. We can get you through that pretty easily and get a project started. 